The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was founded by a man by the name of Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith was born in December of 1805. He was puzzled somewhat about which church to join. So he retired to the woods to pray, but before he did, he read James 1.5 that tells us, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Accordingly, Smith retired to the woods, and knelt, and began to pray. Suddenly, out of the clear blue, two personages appeared to Smith. One pointed to the other, and said, This is my beloved son. Hear him. In answer to which church to join, one told him, Don't join any of them. They're all an abomination in the sight of God. Now keep in mind that this took place around 1820, which meant that he was around 15 years old, maybe 14, but he would be 14 or 15 years old. Now that says a lot about an individual as far as his maturity level. I was called to preach at the age of 13. Preached my first sermon when I was 13 years old. Started pastoring when I was 20. But I was a long way from being mature at that time. So I just want you to be aware of that. That God does use young folks, but it takes time for all of us to mature and to grow. In 1823, Smith had the second of his visions. And in these visions that he had, the second of these visions took place when Moroni came to his bedside, told Smith that there had been a book that had been deposited, written on gold plates, and in that book, it was an account of the former inhabitants of this continent. Now, that would have been the Indians. And it also contained the fullness of the everlasting gospel. In the vision, Smith was shown where the plates were located. The next day, supposedly, he went and found them, but he was not allowed to take them at that time. And then in 1827, the third of these famous visions that Smith is known for took place, and that's where the plates were given to him by a heavenly messenger. It's important to remember and understand about Smith as he started this group. Uh, in 1829, he married Emma Smith. Emma was a school teacher. The two of them translated these plates that he had been given and they were supposedly translated from Egyptian hieroglyphics. The Book of Mormon went on sale in 1830. Now, the two of them translating the plates suggest that they were tran translating the plates to the Book of Mormon when a heavenly messenger came and bestowed on Joseph Smith the priesthood of Aaron. It was later said that it was John the Baptist. It was during this time that Smith was told not to show the plates to anyone who had not been designated by divine revelation. Often that is a reference in the older writings of the Mormon church to a burning in the bosom. There are many accounts as to who saw the plates. In 1830, when the Book of Mormon went on sale, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was organized. Joseph Smith was killed at the hands of a mob, and the burning question then became who will succeed Smith? The date that he was killed was in 1944. Brigham Young was the guy who claimed the authority of the presidency because he said he was the president of the Twelve Apostles. So he became the second president of the Mormon Church. However, there was some conflict because Emma didn't agree with him, and she started what was called the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, recently, they changed their name to the Rec. Uh, Restoration Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, please keep in mind, that's not a non-denominational, interdenominational restoration churches you'll hear about. This is the Restoration Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sometimes referred to as the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Their main group of Mormons is located in Salt Lake City, Utah. The group that followed Emma their headquarters is in Independence, Missouri. Anthony Hoakima, in his book on Mormons, lists at least six different splinter groups that broke off from the main group of Mormons in Salt Lake City. I recently saw a headline, I did not follow up on it, about two towns in small towns where people were complaining that they were not fundamental Mormons who practiced polygamy, so they were not getting 
access to the utilities and various things of that particular community. Now, that's not the Mormons you read about in Salt Lake City. That's not Emma's group and you read about in Independence. That's what you would call a, a fundamental sect that believes that polygamy is necessary. And those who would practice that today don't have license to have a legal marriage by everybody, but it's more of a religious ceremony that takes place. And generally, they're married to one person legally and to the others just in a religious ceremony. So those are some things you run across sometimes when you're looking at the Mormon church. It's important to understand the belief system of the Mormon church. I don't believe that you're ever going to fully understand the Mormons if you don't look at their belief system. This is where you will be able to determine for yourself, are the Mormons Christian? When I speak of what Mormons say publicly, I'm drawing from statements they've made generally on their website over the years, or in some cases, their own writings. I'm also comparing them with some of the key writings of the Mormon church from the past. It seems that these beliefs change over the years, and it's important for us to realize that when their president has a burning in the bosom, they can change anything they want to. When you think about the belief in Jesus Christ, John's gospel introduces him as the word of God who was co-equal and co-eternal with the Father, and as the one by whom all things are created. The Mormons, in one way or another, deny all of this. They deny that the Word who became flesh was unique in His eternality. They deny that He was co-equal with God. They simply make Him one of the spirits of men, gods, and demons who existed co-equally and co-eternally with God. The Savior of Mormonism, however, is entirely different from the person of Jesus Christ that we talk about. According to them, he is not the second person of the Trinity. Most of the Mormons I talk with reject the doctrine of the Trinity. However, the Book of Mormon affirms the doctrine of Trinity. Consider what the previous writers have said. Christ was a pre-existent spirit, the spirit brother of Lucifer. They also believe that Christ celebrated his own marriage to both Marys and Martha, at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. He did this because of his character. And since he had such great character, he had had sexual relations with them, so he wanted to see his seed before he was crucified, so he married them. Now, you can debate the character issue there with the Mormon Jesus. You don't have to worry about it with the Christian Jesus. That was written by Orson Hyde in what was called Journal of Discourses, Volume 4. I find that a lot of Mormon missionaries that come to my house when I approach this subject are not aware that Orson Hyde has said this, by the way. Others are. In regard to the virgin birth, Brigham Young has stated that when the Virgin Mary conceived the child Jesus, the father had begotten in his own likeness, and I'm quoting right now, he was not begotten by the Holy Ghost. And who was the father? He is the first of the human family. And we took a tabernacle, meaning a body, it was begotten by his father in heaven after the same manner as the tabernacle, again, body of Cain, Abel, and the rest of the sons and the daughters of Adam and Eve. Jesus, being our elder brother, according to Mormonism, was begotten in the flesh by the same character that was in the Garden of Eden and who is our father in heaven. So not by the spirit coming over Mary, they're looking to the father and the scripture is very clear that the Father is Spirit. Journal of Discourses, Volume 1, verses 50 and 51, share what Brigham Young has said. The Mormon Church publication reads this way, that every person who was ever born on earth was our spirit brother and sister in heaven. The first spirit born to our heavenly parents was Jesus Christ, so he's our elder brother. Ezra Taft Benson, the 13th president and prophet of the Mormon church, also stated that the Son of God was sired by the same holy being we worship as God, our eternal Father. Jesus was not the son of Joseph, nor was he begotten by the Holy Ghost. He is the son of the eternal Father. So Mormons often say they believe in the virgin birth of Jesus, but it's very obvious by these writings that many of them do not accept it in the sense that it's taught in the Word of God and in the Bible. So it's, it's important to 
understand the emphasis that they place upon their writings. Much of their belief system goes back to these ancient writers and ancient forefathers of theirs. When you look at the Mormons in the Bible, what they believe about the Bible, in order to understand these teachings, it's necessary to capture their thinking. Now, that's not always an easy thing to do. Their concept of inspiration of the Bible, for instance, the value they place on their own writings. There are two items in their doctrinal statement that stand out in these areas, Articles 8 and Articles 9 of their Articles of Faith. Now, one thing you'll find in the Mormon church, you won't find everywhere else, you will find that they do have Articles of Faith. The Articles of Faith will say much about what they believe, and that helps us understand their belief system better. Article 8 will tell you a good bit about this when you get to looking at it, for it says, we believe the Bible to be the Word of God as far as it is translated correctly. But then there's another statement. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. There's two statements in Article 8 that become very important for our understanding of the Bible as far as it's translated correctly. So what are they saying by that? What do they mean by that even more important? This is one of those areas, if you remember back to the introduction to the course, I suggested to you that you would want to find a way of getting away from what they're saying and to make them explain more clearly what their terminology means. When they talk about as far as it's translated correctly, most of the time they're going to say that all the later translations have been distorted and they're wrong. But then they're going to tell you the Book of Mormon is the most accurate and the most updated. If you have a knowledge of the Word of God in that sense, you can deal with them there. If not, this might not be the best area for you to deal with them. Now, Article 9 I include for a specific reason. Let me share this and I'll tell you why. We believe all that God had revealed. We believe all that God does now reveal. And we believe all that He will reveal, or that He will reveal, I'm sorry, many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, what in the world does all of that mean? The Mormon church believes in progressive revelation. That could be why Sandra Turner in the video, The God Makers, put out back in the 80s, makes a statement that the Book of Mormon has been changed over 150 times. Now, Ms. Tanner is a former Mormon who converted to Christianity. The Book of Mormon then is another witness that Jesus Christ really lived, that he was and is God's son. It contains the writings of ancient prophets. One of these, Lehi, lived in Jerusalem around 600 BC and commanded Lehi to lead a small group of people to the American continent and there they became a great civilization. God continued to call prophets among the people. The Book of Mormon is a collection of the writings of their prophets and record keepers. It is named after Mormon, one of the last of these ancient prophets. These prophets knew about the Heavenly Father's plan for his children and the mission of Jesus Christ. They recorded that Christ appeared after his resurrection to the people in America taught them his gospel, formed his church among them. The book contains the teachings of Jesus Christ testifying of his atonement and his love. It supports and verifies the Bible. The Book of Mormon concludes with a great promise that those who read it and sincerely pray about it can know by the Holy Ghost that it is true. Moroni 10.4 from the Book of Mormon says, and when ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Spirit. As I shared with a group of Mormons that came to my house one time, they quoted this verse to me. And I said to him, as a Christian, I believe that the devil can reveal himself as an angel of light because the scripture reveals that. So when you're talking about here, if you sincere, I have heard people who are very sincere, who really had a desire to know the truth, but sometimes they would believe the tr false truth. And that's what you have to be careful of. And so I would say to them, how do you know 
if this is the devil appearing as an angel of light telling you that Moroni is right here, or is this? Now, the Book of Mormon in their writings, it's important to understand that, to say the least, it's an interesting book. If you realize the importance they place on their own writings, then you know the Book of Mormon is an extra scriptural source. When you have to give me back an answer to what is the Book of Mormon on a test, I will accept that as an answer. It's simplified, but I'm more interested in you knowing the Bible than I am you knowing what the Book of Mormon says. The book challenges the Bible. The Book of Mormon is supposed to be a history of two ancient civilizations. These lived on the American continent. The first was named Jaredites. They left the Tower of Babel according to Mormons and immigrated to the Western Hemisphere. They were destroyed due to corruption. You will find that in the Kingdom of Cults by Walter Martin. The other group left Jerusalem somewhere around 600 BC. This book is supposedly a condensed story of the high points of these civilizations. This group was righteous. The Jews, led by Lehi and later his son Nephi, this group was divided into two warring factions or groups, the Nephites and the Lamanites. The Lamanites became known as the Indians. The Lamanites received a curse because of their evil deeds and were cursed to have dark skin. The purpose of this book generally eludes Christian theologians, archaeologists, and students of anthropology. Their problem seems to be around the fact that there has never been anything discovered by any of these groups to support the Book of Mormon. The Mormons consider all biblical texts to be corrupted. 1 Nephi 13.28 In contrast, Mormon believe the Book of Mormon to be historically correct about the people of Jewish descent who lived in Central America from the 6th century B.C., to the 5th century AD. The Doctrine and Covenants is a collection of direct revelations of God given to Joseph Smith plus two church officials. I'm sorry, plus two official church declarations. The Pearl of Great Price, which includes other documents, they include Joseph Smith, the history, the articles of faith. The Mormon church relies on a continuing revelation from God through his prophet and other authorities. It's important to note that historical Christianity has affirmed the canon of Revelation closed. The Bible's God's word. That's sufficient. Almost every false religion or cult seems to have some additional revelation from God. That's where you can get in trouble. Baptism from the Mormon teaching. Jesus taught that we must be baptized by immersion. He set an example himself by being baptized to fulfill all righteousness, Matthew 3. We are baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 and Acts 22. We are also baptized to become members of the Church of Jesus Christ and to enter the Kingdom of God, John 3. Now all three of these are scriptures that the Mormons use and say Jesus taught that we have to be baptized by immersion. Though the ordinance of baptism, we make a promise called a covenant with God. We promise to accept Christ, to become his followers. Now, keep in mind, notice what it says here. Through the ordinance of baptism, we promise to accept Christ. Didn't say you already had. To become his followers, to keep his commandments to the end of our lives. In return, the Heavenly Father promises to forgive our sins and to let us return with him, provided we keep our covenant. So you better not backslide in the Mormon church. Now, they also have baptism that's done for the ancestors. Many people have died without receiving baptism and other ordinances that Jesus Christ taught were necessary to enter the kingdom of God. And they use John 3 to specify this. Because the Heavenly Father wants all of his children to have an opportunity to return to him, he's provided a way for those who have died without these ordinances to receive them. In the Holy Temple, members of the church can perform these ordinances on behalf of their ancestors who have died. This makes it possible for those who have not received these ordinances to accept them if they choose and return to live one day with the Heavenly Father. So if they choose to, they can accept these ordinances, often referred to as the baptism for the dead. I have read that some people have been baptized hundreds of times for the baptism of the dead. 
The Mormons have the greatest genealogy department. I'm even told that they own either controlling interest or part of the interest of Ancestry.com. Now, I'm not knocking that. I'm just stating a fact here. Because they research their family. And I know my wife and I were in Salt Lake City for the Southern Baptist Convention back in the 80s. And I believe that, uh, I believe it was in the 80s. And when we went, we went down to their genealogy building. It's a huge building on Main Street. And they were very helpful to us to try to help us find our genealogy. I didn't have enough information with me, but they gave me names of people that I could send it to. And they would help me with this because they wanted to be a good help. And they were very caring and compassionate folks. And one of the reasons is they want to look up these names and have somebody get baptized for them as baptism for the dead encounters. It doesn't mean they go to a planet and populate it as a god, but it means that they go to one of the lower states of heaven. I'll cover shortly. The Mormon doctrine of man is seen when you come to a very simple doctrine. There are two statements I will give you here. One comes from the King Follett Discourse, one from the Millennial Star. You've got to learn to be God yourself, the same as all other gods before you have done. Or, as man is, God was. As God is, man may become. So that tells you that Mormons have the desire to become a god, ultimately. We know that Romans 3.23 tells us all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Therefore, man is a sinner, and no scripture supports the teaching of man becoming a god. So this is a distortion of the word of God. The Mormons and salvation. There's a personal salvation is one of the doctrines emphasized in the Mormon church. Since Christianity is about the good news of God's love and redemption through Christ, it's inevitable there will be a conflict. The goal of every Mormon is to become a God. In order for that to happen, there must be an acceptance of the Mormon faith and you must adhere strictly to all of the laws and the ordinances and be obedient. This will enable you to continue in this relationship. And they believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind will be saved. And notice this goes with it by obedience to the laws and the ordinances of the gospel. So you've got to have that. These ordinances are as follow, and I have those listed for you. There has to be a faith in Christ, but I would remind you, this is not the same Christ you and I know as Christians. Baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. So there they're adding what Acts says, and they're taking it out of context and not knowing what that passage teaches. Obedience to the teaching of the Mormon church. That's keeping the commandments of God. They believe that as they keep those commandments, that will cleanse away the stain of sin. Journal of Discourses, chapter 2, or volume 2, verse 4. The laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Spirit, good works, and repentance. And in the list I've seen, repentance doesn't come near the top. It just comes in. Brigham Young once made this statement. Now, most Mormons today don't want to hear this. It took Jesus' blood to cleanse some sin, takes man's own blood to cleanse some sin. Common in their literature is this statement, all men are saved by grace alone without any act on their part. Yet also according to their writings, they believe in a universal salvation. In order for a Mormon to become God and populate a planet after he dies, he must be involved in that secret celestial marriage in the Mormon temple. In order for this to take place, there must be a temple recommend from the local Mormon church. I knew a couple that were an elderly couple in a town that I pastored in once. They ran the local newspaper. They were in their 70s, I believe, when they received their temple recommend, went out to Salt Lake City to the Mormon church and had their secret ceremony. Now, there's a lot of people who will look at the temple of the God makers as an old video many years ago. And in the temple of the God makers, keep in mind that there is a much similarities between the ceremony as it's revealed by some former Mormons than, and the Masons, the Masonic Lodge. Now, the reason is that is not that the Masons are Mormon, although some Mormons may be Masons, but it's because Joseph Smith was a part of the Masonic Lodge and he incorporated in the secret ceremony of the Mormon church a lot of the things that he found in the Masonic Lodge. That's just wanted you to be aware of that. The Mormons and their doctrine of God 
We must keep in mind that the God of Mormon theology is not the God of the Bible. You might even go so far as to say the God of present-day Mormon theology is not even the God of the Book of Mormon. Article 1 of the Articles of Faith of the Mormon Church says this, We believe in God, the Eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. The teachings of Joseph Smith, verse 349 says, In the beginning the head of the gods called a council of the gods. They came together and concocted a plan to create the world and the people in it. Then later you'll find in the teachings of Smith, God was once as we are and is an exalted man. He rose to Godhood by his own power. In order for us to know the only true and living God, then we must become a God ourselves. Now when that happens, he's not the only true and living God. Uh, unless you want to look at that and say we're a dead God. And that's not what they're implying either. Secondly there, the Father has a body of flesh and bone as tangible as man. The Son also. But the Holy Spirit has not a body of flesh and bone, but is a personage of spirit, doctrine and covenants. Third, gods exist. We better strive to be one with them. Them being the key word there. Number four there, remember that God our Heavenly Father was perhaps once a child like we. And he rose step by step in the scale of progress. In the school of advancement, he's moved forward and overcome until he's arrived at the point where he is now. We could continue to quote many from whom volumes of Mormon writings, but I think you get the idea. Now Talmud said in the Holy Spirit, he declares in Doctrine and Covenants that the Holy Spirit is a personage of spirit. And obviously an immaterial being and obviously God I realize that that's what they believe. Now, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Mormons and eschatology. The Mormons believing as they do in a literal second event of Christ teach that at his return, the Jews will have been gathered to Palestine. The Mormons will be miraculously gathered together in Missouri, independence by the way. And the judgment of the Lord will be poured out upon the earth everywhere except on the old and the new Jerusalem. The Mormons in heaven have an interesting viewpoint there. They believe in the bodily resurrection of all in salvation and in a threefold heaven. There is the telestial state. Most adults will be in this region of heaven. It's reserved for those who might be called heathen and who reject the gospel and live according to the world. There is the terrestrial state. This state will be inhabited by Christians who did not accept the Mormon message, along with men of goodwill of other religions who reject the revelation of the gospel. It's also included Mormons that didn't live up to their church's requirement. But then there's the celestial state. This is divided into three kingdoms, the highest of which is godhood or possession of one's kingdom. In order to qualify for this, you have to have that seal marriage in the temple. Now, what can we learn from the Mormon church? Well, for one thing, they have an excellent mission program. Their members spend two years on the mission field at their own expense. Now, sometimes somebody can't afford it. They will help them, but they give up two years of their life. And we could look at numerous people, sports uh, personalities, uh, business people that have spent two years on the mission field. Another thing is they're faithful tithers. Their church has a great welfare system because they're faithful to tithing and they will help their members out. If you're out of work, they will also help you find a job and they just, they spend a lot of time trying to help out their folks. How do you witness to a Mormon? Well, they're not a hot prospect. It will help if you have some knowledge of what they believe. You will more than anything need to know what you believe. So I would suggest you discuss what Christ means to you right now as you're dealing with them. While it's okay to discuss the meaning of the new birth and being saved, the Mormon will want to know how he, meaning Christ, is real in your life today. So you need to spend time with him enough so you can be able to let them know how Jesus Christ is real in your life. That's vital that you do that. You might ask them concerning their goal to become a God. Look for ways of discussing that with them. Then it would be good to sow the seed of your belief that Christianity teaches that salvation rests entirely on God's work in Christ. Walk through the plan of salvation as the Bible teaches. 
Many of them will tell you they believe that also, but you might point out that the Mormon church teaches more is necessary. Except the Mormon, expect the Mormon to give you a presentation from the Bible, but don't expect it to be clear and convincing. Gently show them where they're wrong if you can, but treat them with respect. When you can press them for more information, do so and try to be clear with them about what they believe. Get them to say it. Whatever you attempt to do, sow the seed of the gospel. That's the most important thing you can do. And I would remind you the Mormons lost and they need Jesus. They don't need somebody trying to show them how much they know. And I pray and ask Jesus will lead you and guide you that you might pray and encourage them to ask Jesus to break your heart for these folks that are lost, it's coming to you. In recent days, I've tried being nice, asking them questions about their founder. And I do so in a very nice and polite way. His dreams, their belief in the Bible, and look for mistakes that I can speak to them about. I didn't put all this down, but I want to share with you. And recently, I had two to come to my house, and I began to ask them about their founder. <coughs> Excuse me. And they couldn't tell me much about him. And I said, tell me about his visions. And I discovered they didn't know the visions. Well, I did, so I told them what uh, the visions were about. And then I asked them about the Bible and about Articles 8 and 9, and they did not quote me Articles 8 and 9, so I quoted Articles 8 and 9 to them. And I said to them, well, let me tell you this. You know, I appreciate you guys and I respect you. You you really believe what you're out here sharing and I wish more people who believe the way I do would get out and share what they believe. I want you to know I respect you for that. And I want you to know that I'm not trying to be rude or disrespectful to what you believe. But I want to share with you what Jesus Christ means to me and that's how I'm going to heaven. So I go through several things that have taken place recent days in my life. And... And if I do that here, that may be old by the time you hear this. But I encourage you. Some years ago, I did this and I shared, you know, my wife got sick a couple of years ago at the time down in Fort Worth. And we didn't know what was happening for three days. They gave her 10 units of blood. We didn't know what was causing the problem. The doctors didn't. And I shared with them how that we were preparing for the worst and not knowing what was going on. But all of a sudden, what Jesus did and how he gave us a peace and how he gave my sons a peace. And in dealing with all of this, I was trying to share with them, this is what Jesus does and what Christ can do in our lives. And the way they countered was with this verse about, as we read the Book of Mormon, we believed sincerely and asked and the Holy Spirit revealed to us. And so I shared with them about the devil could present himself as an angel of light. And I just encourage them, you be careful about that. And I would encourage you to put the Bible away. I mean, put the Book of Mormon away and just read the Bible. And I would encourage you to read John's gospel. And if you'll do that and just ask God to reveal to you, don't ask Joseph Smith, don't ask anybody else, just God to reveal to you, if this is true, show me. And I looked to them because they had asked me about praying early on and I let them. And I said, can I pray for you guys now? Because they were ready to go. And so I had a prayer with them. It was one of the best meetings I've had with a group of Mormons. And just try to be respectful, caring, compassionate, and share the gospel. And what I did through the process of all this, I got into the gospel presentation a little bit. So I encourage you to think about this and to pray about it and let God use you. That's my prayer for you today. God bless you and thank you.